see you all this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Why don't we stand and we're going to join together in singing Hear All Creation. Let's sing together. Hear all creation lift its voice the mountains sing and the rivers rejoice for the name of Jesus for his name and we his people saved by grace we bow our hearts and we bring our praise to the sweet redeemer for his Everything we are and everything we have, we pour out our offerings. And if ever we should fail, the rocks will rise up and crown him the King of Kings. He mends our hearts, he keeps our ways. He lights our nights and He leads our days all for His glory, for His name. There's nothing greater than to be His, to bring Him glory and to fully live for the name of Jesus, for His name. So with everything we are and everything we have, we pour out our offerings. And if ever we should fail, the rocks will rise up and crown him the King of Kings. So with everything we are and everything we have, we pour out our offerings. And if ever we should fail, the rocks will rise up and crown him the King of Kings. faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness who walk by faith and not by sight by faith our fathers roam the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by god's own hand a place where peace and justice reign we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our soul's reward Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophet saw a day when the longed-for Messiah would appear. With the power to break the chains of sin and death And rise triumphant from the grave By faith the church was called to go In the power of the Spirit to the lost To deliver captive 
captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work not by sight by faith this mountain shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall prevail for we know in Christ all things are Everybody, happy Sunday, and thanks for joining us on this really rainy day, and snow and sandy, by the way. <laughs> so we're going to have our confession this morning. Oh God, in your goodness, you defend the weak and uphold the cause of the poor. In our unholy carelessness, we let the poor struggle on their own, not seeing them, not caring about them and seldom asking about them. O oh God, friend of the helpless, you sent your son to proclaim good news to the poor. But we care much more about those who already have enough and ignore those who lack even the simplest essentials of life. Holy judge of all, convict and correct us, we pray. Amen. Now we're going to sing Christian, Do You Struggle, which I know I sure do. <laughs> Christian, do you struggle?
now for our assurance. This is found in Romans 5, verses 8 and 9. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And our call to godly living, we're going to read this together. It's from Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. And now if you will rise with us, we're going to sing, Come, Behold the Wondrous Mystery. Let's go to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you that we could be here at church this morning, 
uh, with others who love us and love you. God, we thank you for the, the rain that replenishes the earth and makes the creation around us beautiful and lush. And we, uh, we pray for, uh, for safety and we pray for those that, um, that live outside, Lord, that you would provide for them and care for them in this time. God, we, uh, we think of our uh, church family here and people that are suffering in body or in spirit, people that uh, are in the hospital or struggle with uh, depression, mental health, different disorders, Lord. Uh, many of us this morning are, are thinking of Angie Borsma, who, uh, who is still in the hospital after um, her stroke, Lord. And we just pray that you would heal her, that uh, you would allow her to, be, um, to uh, leave the hospital this week, Lord, and, and be, just be healed and be restored. And we pray that uh, she'll worship again with us soon, Lord. Uh, we pray for, uh, for Marion and Jim and for the whole Borsma family as, um, as Angie, the, the rock, and um, their, um, their support in so many ways is, um, is sick now, God. And we pray for healing in her life. God, we, uh, we thank you for the events of the past week and the ways that we were able to love our community through the trunk or treat and through We Belong and other ministries. And uh, we pray for the, the week ahead, Lord, and the month ahead as we uh, soon will come to Advent and remembering your, um, your birth into this world that you loved us so much that you became a human being and, and went to the cross for us. Uh, Lord, as we hear about that, that message, as we hear about salvation this morning, give us ears to hear. Uh, give us a, um, a heart to, uh, to know and to love you. Give us feet to walk the path. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, good morning again. I'm Pastor Pete. I'm the pastor here, and I just have a couple of announcements, ways that you can be involved in our community and grow in your faith. Um, we have a prayer card that will be in the, um, in the pew in front of you if you would like to share or update your information and, or you have a prayer concern that, that the elders and I could pray about. Uh, we would love to, um, to get that from you if you fill that out and then drop it in the offering plate in a few minutes here. Um, there's a newsletter that goes out every Friday and Sunday with ways to be involved with the church. And uh, just w a couple more announcements, and then I'm going to uh, invite Andrew and Tony up. They have a couple announcements as well. But uh, Thanksgiving Day, we are going to have a worship service here at 10 o'clock. And then I'm also um, kind of organizing folks. Maybe you want to host someone that doesn't have a lot of family around. Please let me know. Or maybe you'd like to share Thanksgiving with um, someone from church. Let me know that also. And then I can kind of play matchmaker and get, um, get folks together for that day. We also have been approached by a couple of local elementary schools. And there's a lot of families uh, in our community that are really struggling this year that are, are not going to be able to provide gifts for their kids. And so we would like to step in and, um, and help them with that. If we could just adopt a few kids and get Christmas presents for them. So there is a sign-up sheet um, on the, um, out there in the, in the lobby. And they're asking us how many kids that we can help. So if you could sign up today and let me know if you can buy one present or two or whatever. The, the range is like $15 to $25. And then I can let them know. And then we'll be collecting them the first week of December to give to Davis Elementary and to Park Lane Elementary here. So thank you guys so much for your generosity in that. Um, I'm going to invite Andrew up at this time, our uh, youth director, to make an announcement. Good morning. Um, I have the, the wonderful opportunity to talk to you about something cool that we're going to be doing here in the next week. On Saturday the 12th, we have a beautiful, thank you Paul for putting this up on the screen, 
Um, Saturday the 12th, we are going to be having a um, fundraising event for a day of outreach that we will be doing later this winter. So earlier this summer, we had the idea because plans for a mission trip didn't work out. We decided to do a day of outreach here in Portland in our, in our, our hometown. So we packed up a bunch of sack lunches as us, the youth group, and we took to the streets and we handed them out. We had conversations with people and it was really meaningful and really impactful. And it, it just felt like this is, this is something that we as our youth ministry should be pouring into, that we should be caring and loving for, for people who really need love and care. So we are planning another day of outreach coming up. But to support this day of outreach, we decided to do a fundraiser where we are going to feed you all spaghetti. Woo! And as, as a compensation for our mad spaghetti-making skills, we are asking that as a price of entry, a donation of new socks, hats, and gloves. That like So as you come in, we'll have a bucket. Socks, hats, gloves go into the bucket. Then said socks, hats, and gloves will go to our friends who live outside and so that they, they can, can be warm and be dry, amongst other things. So, yeah, November 12th, invite your friends. It's just going to be spaghetti. It's going to be cool. You're going to have a great time. My friend Charlie, who played for our, our worship service, is going to come in and play some piano. It's going to be cool. Um, so yeah, make it if you can, and I'm going to pass it on to Tony. Ask me any questions if you have any. Thank you. Just wanted to give you guys a quick update. Um, we had our two board meetings for Camp Calvin. No director has stepped forward, so we're doing a team approach this year, which is I'll be one of the directors, and we are not doing it at Lost Creek Village for the first time in, I think, 60 years, I think it's been. So we're doing it at a camp called Camp Arowana. It's about 40 minutes from here. So Ginger and Amy Toonstra and I are going to go look at the camp next week to uh, see what it's all about. And we're only expecting about 25 kids this year because Sunnyside is not joining us this year. But it's just the way it is. And um, the price, will, we will be, uh, there will be more dates or details later when we get promotional stuff out and everything we just wanted to start updating everybody now on Camp Calvin for next year. We are moving forward for the first time in four years, I think it's been. So, yeah, just keep praying for that and help help us to be able to get this camp moving forward again. Thanks, Tony. Okay, at this time, the deacons will come forward to receive your tithes and offerings.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come together every week to rejoice and give thanks and to sing. And we ask, Lord, as part of our worship, we carefully examine our hearts and our livelihoods and help us to share generously with those in need in our congregation, in our neighborhood, in our world. As deacons, we ask for discretion and wisdom as we allot these funds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to turn now to God's Word. After our Reformation Day service last week, we are starting a new, a little three-week sermon series on the book of Joel. There are three chapters in Joel, and we have three weeks until Advent. Um, So it's almost like I planned it. Um, We're going to take a look at Joel chapter 1 this morning, and it will be up on the screen uh, behind me. As I... Uh, discovered and remembered the last couple weeks. It's a, it's a fascinating book. It has a lot to teach us about our world today. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to just expound on it uh, the next couple weeks. So let's, uh, let's take a look at Joel chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine, wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the husband of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the joy of mankind is withered away. Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God, for the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Alas, for that day, for the day of the Lord is near, it will come like destruction from the Almighty. Has not the food been cut off before our very eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins. The granaries have been broken down, for the grain has dried up. How the cattle moan. The herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. To you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the open pastures, and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up, and fire has devoured the open pastures. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I read the, um, the biography of the... Front man for U2, Bono. He has a biography that came out this week, and I read it. And it's, uh, he has a really, really interesting life. He's in his 60s now, and this is his memoir and, and everything that he's experienced in his life. He grew up 
uh, in Ireland in the 70s and 80s, and there was uh, violence, sectarian violence, uh, between Catholics and Protestants. And he had a unique situation because his mom was Protestant and his dad was Catholic. So imagine the way that he felt caught in the middle between these two sides that were, you know, bombing each other. And it was nearly civil war in Ireland in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, there are a lot of reasons why um, young adults walk away from the church. And he certainly had reason to do that, right? I mean, can you imagine going to a church and you're at war with another part of the body of Christ? But instead of that, Bono and, and two of the other guys from the band, U2, they were radically saved in this Christian renewal movement that was called Shalom. And uh, as high schoolers, they became people of faith. And instead of walking away from, uh, from Christ, instead of walking away from the church, they, they hung in. They grew, they looked to Christ, and um, he says again and again in the book that Jesus is the rock of his life, even today. And it's been funny to see all the interviews that he's doing on CBS and NPR and all these unlikely places, and everybody keeps asking him, really, Jesus? <laughs> and he, sa he says in the book, anytime anybody says, stand up if you want to follow Jesus, I'm there, I'm the one, I'm, I'm, I'm there to go for it. So instead of walking away from faith, they, he's had this foundation his whole life of Christ. And he wrote these songs, even back then, even in the midst of the violence. Um, their first big song back in, I think it was 1983 or 84, was called Sunday Bloody Sunday. And it was about that violence. It was about the war between Catholics and Protestants in Ireland. And... He, here's some of the lyrics. He said, I can't believe the news today. I can't close my eyes and make it go away. How long, how long must we sing this song? So that last line is just a quote of Psalm 13. Psalm 13, that psalm of lament, similar to Joel 1, a call to lament, a call to, to, um, to repent, a call to bow down, a call to come back to God. How long do we have to sing this song? Lament. Lament means that you are complaining to God and yet you're holding tightly to him at the same time. Lament is like what Jacob did when he wrestled with God all through the night. Lament was what Jesus did when he was on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet it's the, the psalms of lament, they frequently end with confessing God's goodness and remembering that even though we're complaining to him, even though we're lamenting, even though we're crying out, he's God. He remains God. So that psalm that they quoted, that psalm that they worked into a lyric that's been played on radio for 40 years, it ends this way. But I trust in your unfailing love. That's the end of Psalm 13. I trust in your unfailing love. So this morning, I just want to um, talk with you guys about lament and repentance. What does it mean? What does it mean to lament? What does it mean to repent? Why does Joel write all these things? Why does he use all these images and this poetry to try to get us, you know, to pay attention and to wake up. So we're going to look at those two themes of lament and repent. You know, how it happened back then in Joel's time and what it means for us today. So, first, the, the text of Joel 1. He talks a lot about locusts. <laughs> Locusts destroying everything. You know, this has never happened in their lifetime. 
And it, it, no, nothing, no locust herd or locust swarm has happened since the days of the Exodus when God used it, you know, to punish the, the Egyptians. But they say in verse 3, there's four generations. You know, from an old woman to her great-grandchild. You know, ask. Ask around. Has anything like this ever happened? They didn't have newspapers in that day. They didn't have the internet. They couldn't look up historical things. But has any, can anybody ever remember anything like this happening? No. No. And there's, then there's this description of these, of these locusts, this swarm of locusts that just destroyed everything. I mean, imagine living in an agricultural society. Imagine being in charge of a farm and it's all gone. It's all destroyed. The, 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 they list these four different types of locusts and they all kind of build on each other. And even a, uh, an article from National Geographic somewhat recently, in the 20th century, but somewhat recently, it said, we marvel at how Joel, this ancient writer, could have given so graphic and true a description of the devastation caused by locusts. So, so he knew exactly how it worked. This one came and got it, then this one took more, then this one took more, and then the last type took everything. You know, some, the, the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and every locust was worse than the other. Well, Pastor Pete, why are you up here giving us like a biology lesson on locusts? Because it's a symbol. It's a metaphor. It's a picture. Pay attention. God's trying to wake them up. God's trying to warn them by allowing these locusts to come and to change their economy and change the way that they, that they get their food and all that sort of thing. God is showing how much he loves them by sending them this warning sign. If God didn't love people, he would just allow them to, uh, to be destroyed. But he's giving them this warning shot. And it's four people. There's four different types of people that are being warned. The elders... You know, think about the, the wise sages of our community. They're the ones that would be able to say, I've lived 80, 90, 100 years, and I've never seen anything like this. It's never happened before. And maybe, maybe they would be the ones most apt to listen because they could see how serious it was. And then the younger generations listen to them, right? Talks about the elders. And then the next group he's, he warns are the drunkards. Because he's like, y'all ain't going to be getting drunk anymore. Your grapes are gone. Your wine is gone. And it's not just the grapes for your wine, but the fig tree and the pomegranate, the palm tree, the apple tree. He wants to warn them too because their lifestyle is going to have to change because there's no more grapes on the vine. And then the third group, he talks to the priests. In verse 9, he warns them. So he talks to me so that I can pass along the message. And he's, but he's saying, you know, the basic stuff that you use in your church, even the, like their equivalent of the grape juice and the bread that we serve on communion, there's not even enough for that. Even that is wiped out by these locusts, by this swarm that came, by the plague that's coming and the famine that's coming. And who is going to come and bring um, offerings, bring grain, bring, bring a lamb to sacrifice? Who's going to do that if everything's wiped out? And then finally, the farmers. There's no more harvest. There's nothing for you to, to grow and to, to eat and to share. And there's not going to be anything next year either. And what does all of this mean? What do the locusts represent? That God is trying to get your attention. God is trying to get your, your attention. Joel's saying, this is not a coincidence. God is trying to stir us up. Our economy is decimated. God is speaking to us. He wants us to come back to him, to look to him. 
And Joel understands this because he says in the last couple of verses, to you, O Lord, I call. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up. That's kind of like the equivalent of when Jesus said, if the rocks will, you know, if the people don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. Even the wild animals are panting for God. They're saying, God, give us some relief. Spare us from this. Even the, another translation calls them the dumb beasts. <laughs> so even the dumb beasts understand that something's going on. Isn't that crazy? Animals. You know, you see this even with your dogs. Sometimes our dogs know what's up. <laughs> right? They know when something bad has happened. They know when another animal is sick and all that sort of thing. Joel's saying the same thing is happening. That the beasts of the field are figuring out that God wants our attention before human beings are. Crazy. So, what does that mean for us? Is God trying to get our attention today? You know, as a culture, as a church, even as individuals, is God trying to get your attention is he trying to get my attention? Well, it seems to me that there is a, a shaking going on. Culture is changing. And hear me correctly when I say this. We're living in apocalyptic times. We're living in apocalyptic times. Do you know what apocalyptic means? It means uncovering. It means revealing. It means like taking the, the top off a jar. Or in the words of the great cultural critic and philosopher Damian Lillard. When people show you who they are, believe them. When people show you who they are, believe them. This is an apocalyptic time. It, it's the people's true colors are coming out. We saw that, right? We saw that the last few years where you can see where people's true hope really lies. It gave us a picture, and it wasn't always a pretty picture. There was good, but there was also bad, and there was also ugly, because it exposed a lot of the idols of our culture, and even of the church. You know, wouldn't you, Joel's talking a lot about the day of the Lord, right? Wouldn't you want a warning of the day of the Lord? You know, Martin Luther said, I live my life in such a way that Jesus went to heaven yesterday and he's coming back tomorrow. When that day comes, and you know, we think about this a lot in the Advent season, right? We prepare our hearts for when Christ is going to return and judge the evildoer and make things right and bring restoration and bring his wholeness to the earth. God's not going to come. Whenever that day is. <laughs> and nobody knows. Not even Jesus knows. No preacher knows. But whenever that day comes. People won't be able to say. God's not going to say. Oh sorry guys. I didn't send you any warnings. I, you had no idea that this was going to happen. God is warning us. He has given us a wake-up call. And even God's warnings are a sign of his grace, right? They're a sign of his grace. Like I said before, if God didn't love us, he wouldn't warn us. He would just wrap everything up. But like a loving father, he warns us. When we were kids, our parents warned us, don't put your hand on that stove. Don't jump off the roof. Don't cross the street without looking both ways. And God is a million times better than any father in this room. He's a faithful father. He's an incredible parent to us. And so he warns us. God is always trying to get people to wake up. And especially, especially to repent. 
When Jesus came on the scene, the first message that he had, this is in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And sort of like that word apocalypse, the word repent has also gotten a bad rap. Because we saw too many people on TV or too many people at a rock concert or too many people in cartoons holding a sign that said, repent, the end is near. But repent just means turn around. Turn around. Stop focusing so much on yourself and think about God and his glory. Think about how you can love others. We, we heard something in Sunday school this morning that the middle letter in sin is I, right? S-I-N. So you know when you're totally focused on yourself, on I, on me, on what I want, on what I need, and you never think of anyone else, that's sin. I remember when I was in high school, um, one of my closest friends, his dad was this brilliant, brilliant man. They had this beautiful house on Puget Sound. He was, you know how people make jokes about brain surgery? Like, well, it's not brain surgery. This guy was literally a brain surgeon. So he could say, yeah, technically it is brain surgery. It's, it's, it's actually brain surgery. It's really difficult. He came to Christ radically, changed his whole life. He was probably my age or older. And he became a Christian and he... Um, just became devout. He even put a bumper sticker on his very fancy car that said, if you're heading in the wrong direction, God allows U-turns. You, maybe you've seen that one before, but it's pretty good. A little cheesy, but pretty good. That's repentance. Repentance, or another word that I love that's in that category is surrender. Surrender. It means to surrender to God. And there's a lot of reasons why we are insulated from hearing God's call today. Um, From from listening when God is trying to get our attention. We, you know, some of us are are just so, so busy. Because it's hard to hear God's still small voice when we are so, so busy with all of our stuff or our family's needs or our loved one's needs, all that sort of thing. Some of us are, um, some of us are just starting in our Christian journey, and we haven't, we haven't learned yet how to hear God's voice. Um, sometimes we're distracted by, by technology and by concerns of the world. Sometimes, um, you know, our, our circumstance in life, like a difficult um, economic situation, just trying to put bread on the table um, and just scrape by prevents us from hearing God's voice. On the other hand, We might be really comfortable and be complacent. Remember uh, a couple weeks ago I shared that quote about wearing crash helmets in the sanctuary. If we were really serious about what God would do, we should all be wearing crash helmets. Maybe maybe we we don't want to know what God says (laughs) because then we would have to change our life. We would have to surrender but even even the locusts are a grace even the locusts are a grace if we have the eyes to see you know what's what's worse than a painful circumstance that that you know to get your attention being being immune being immune to pain and suffering i'm blocking everything out God loves us enough to warn us, to try to get our attention through lots of different means. And we talk a lot about his love and his grace and his mercy, which is incredible. But part of his love and his grace and his mercy is to get our attention, to warn us, to call us to repentance. Um, there, would, there wouldn't be this book in the Bible if everything started out perfectly. You know, if it was like, hear, hear this, you elders. Things are great. They're perfect. They're peachy keen. Tell your children that life is perfect, always prosperous, no problems, no swarming locusts here. 
drunkards, keep on drinking. You guys have fun. Have a great night. All the sweet wine you can drink. No, it's, it's a warning. Nobody wants to go through the trials and the hurt and the pain. Nobody wants to have their business wiped out like all these people did. Nobody wants to, to go hungry or not know where their next meal is coming from. And yet it's in the challenges and the difficulties that our faith grows. There's a, a woman in, in my Sunday school class and she shared about a really painful trial she went through, the death of a loved one. And she said when she started out, she just kept asking, God, why? Why? How could you let this happen? Why, God? And yet as she moved through her grief and as she, as she lamented, so she complained to God, but she held on to God. As she, as she grieved and lamented and mourned, she got to this place of saying, God, why not? Why not me? This is a broken world. Bad things happen to good people. And yet, God is a redeemer. And God brings us through the trial. And he strengthens our faith through it. So just as God was gracious back then to warn people, he's gracious to warn us today. Here's what a, here's what a pastor wrote recently about Joel. Joel. Here is the bottom line, the point of Joel's prophecy. Both the delays in God's judgment and the preview of judgment in such catastrophic events as locust plagues and earthquakes are for our good, that we might repent. In America, we haven't seen many disasters of this magnitude, but few would deny that times are not good and that even worse times may be ahead. Our cities have been ravaged by blight and riot, by corruption and other forms of decay. We haven't been destroyed by locusts, but we've seen our economy weakened by the declining value of the dollar and shortages of oil and other necessities. We've had droughts. Are we to make light of such things? Are we to dismiss them and just go our normal way? Are we to say such things just happen? Are we to blame Russia or communism, or Iran, or Islam. No doubt God does use causes, and the opposition of these or other countries may be among them, but the wise will see things as having come from God and lead us in repentance. The wise will see all these things, and they will be the first to repent to be humble, to say they're sorry, to turn and go in another direction. You know what's crazy about that quote? It wasn't written in 2022, when we have problems with Russia and Iran, when we have a declining dollar, when we have shortages, when we have droughts, when we have a full lunar eclipse on election day. I don't know what that means. But this was written back in 1983. That was crazy to me. I felt like he was reading today's paper. Pastor James Montgomery um, Blyce of Philadelphia, a Presbyterian pastor, wrote these things. And he's with the Lord now. But wise people heed God's warning and are the first to bend the knee to God. I want to bring it back to the place that I started. Uh, Bono's book was so amazing. It's called Surrender. And they took, the, the, they took the tragedy of their time and they wrote these laments. And they even they took that song, Sunday Bloody Sunday, about this bomb that had exploded and about innocent people that lost their life. And even, I never knew this, I've been listening to the song my whole life, but John Lennon wrote a song called Sunday Bloody Sunday. So they took that title and they wrote a different song and they turned it into a gospel song. Because the last verse goes like this. 
Again, this feels like it's straight out of the newspaper today. It said, it's true we are immune when fact is fiction and TV is reality. So we could say, you know, when fact is fiction and social media is reality and, you know, uh, reality TV is reality and all these other things are reality, everything's kind of flipped around backwards. And he, he goes on, today the millions cry, we eat and drink while tomorrow they die. The real battle has just begun to claim the victory that Jesus won on Sunday, Bloody Sunday. So they took the tragedy of this bombing that happened on a Sunday and they pointed people to Easter and to Good Friday and to Easter and the, and the way that Jesus defeated sin and death. The way that when we repent, when we bow the knee to Jesus, he receives us back completely, fully, because of his love for us, because of his never stopping, never giving up love. To claim the victory Jesus won on Sunday, bloody Sunday. Jesus has won the victory. Repent and believe the good news. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are always there for us. That you invite us to be like the prodigal son and just come to our senses and turn around and come back to you. That you are always, you're not only there just waiting for us, but you run after us and you run toward us and you throw a party when one sinner like me turns around and comes back to you. God, thank you that you love us enough to warn us and we pray that we see you know, interruptions to our life, changes in our culture, inconveniences in our life, struggles, death, disease, things we don't understand, God, that we see them not as from your hand but as allowed by you in order to transform us, in order to make us more like you, Lord. So God, mature us in the faith. Help us to see trials as opportunities for growth. And humble us, Lord. Humble us as we come back to you. We ask this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Um, there's a lament that we're going to sing as our song of response. Plaintive is the song I sing. It's number 643 in Lift Up Your Hearts. If you want to turn there, it's also on the screen. But let's stand and let's worship together.
go out into God's world with his love, with his blessing, with his warnings that are even a part of his grace. Receive his blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Our final song uh, this morning is Give Me Jesus. Let's sing and worship together. Smile.